Good morning. I'm Chris Johnson. I direct the Scientific Computing and Imaging Institute at the University of Utah. Our acronym is SCI, which is pronounced SKI. We're the SKI Institute. If you've ever been to Utah, you, you might know why we chose that particular acronym. Uh, we're an interdisciplinary research institute, about 200 faculty, staff, and students uh, that do work in visualization and scientific computing and uh, image analysis. Before I get started on my research talk, I want to give you a little history. I, uh, I do this coming from Utah because a lot of people don't know that computer graphics and visual computing basically started at, in Utah. Uh, this guy, these guys up here, David Evans and Ivan Sutherland, started a, a Department of Computer Science back in uh, 1968 at the University of Utah. And uh, they created this environment and really created computer graphics. They got this large ARPA grant of $5 million a year back in the late 60s, early 70s, which is a huge amount of money, uh, uh, to basically create computer graphics. This is John Warnock, who got his PhD at Utah. Uh, you might know him as the, uh, the co-creator of Adobe. He's one of the co-authors of PostScript and then PDF. Ed Catmull got his PhD at Utah. He uh, co-founded Pixar and is still the president of Pixar and now Disney Animation. It's Jim Clark who got his PhD at Utah. He founded SGI and then also Netscape and then Healthion and my CFO and many others. This is Nolan Bushnell who uh, got his bachelor's degree at Utah. He created Pong, the first video game. Uh, and then he uh, founded Atari, uh, of one of the first video game companies. He sold Atari for $200 million. Uh, and then he founded Chuck E. Cheese Pizza Time Theaters. <laughs> Which, uh, I don't think we're quite as successful, but I guess if you have kids, that it might, you might think they're successful. Anyway, just these amazing people. This is Alan Kay, who created object-oriented languages uh, and won the Turing Award uh, a few years ago. Ivan won a Turing Award for his computer graphics work. So it's, uh, it's, I come from this very rich history of visual computing at uh, Utah. And here are the, uh, the faculty at the Ski Institute uh, and working in the areas of visualization and, and uh, analysis and computer graphics. All right, uh, my, what I need is my stand. I can't see my slides. Throw them over there. <laughs> One second. Here we go. All right. So we, within the institute, we direct a number of research institutes, uh, including ones from NIH and DOE, also from industry. This uh, computational earth sciences center is, is funded by ExxonMobil. And we're part of a number of national research institutes, including the DOE SIDAC program, uh, SDAV for scientific data analysis and, and management, which is a large multiple laboratory and multiple university uh, center. Um, as well as uh, other NIH and, and international centers. Okay, so I think that this, my talk fits very well uh, with Peter's talk as a follow-on uh, because it's a, a lot about big data and it's about how are we going to make sense of that data. So here's this great graph that uh, Landauer and Les created when they were trying to summarize the amount of data that we were creating. And uh, they started back in the early 2000s and they estimated that if we took all of the data at that time in the form of books and films and other digital data and we summarized that all up, how much would that be? And it came out to be about 12 exabytes, so 12 times 10 to the 18th amount of data. A couple of lines of interest here. Uh, in about 2003 was the first time that, that we had at that time as much data as our previous 40,000 years of human history. It, it was not all identical. There was lots of, of duplicated data, but we crossed that line for the first time. And then in about 2006 was the first year that in that year alone, we created new digital data that equaled the 40,000 years of data creation of our human history. This is a logarithmic graph, uh, and so these are really exponential lines here. If you look at uh, last year, we, were, we had created 295 exabytes of new data. 
And it is the case now that it's every other day we create as much data as we did from the beginning of mankind until 2003. So if you think you are overwhelmed with data, inundated with data, you are, and it's only going to get worse, okay? Now, we throw around these terms a lot, uh, terabytes, petabytes, exabytes. So these days, exabytes, exascale comes into our language all the time. You can even hear people on the hill say the words like exabytes, and do you really know how much that is? It's easy to say, but what is it? So I decided to do a little back of the envelope computation of how much of uh, is an exabyte, and my question was, how many trees does it take to print out one exabyte? Okay, so you can find, you can figure out that one exabyte holds about that many pages of standard text, so this is a standard book. You can also find out that one average book, uh, wood tree that they would use to produce uh, paper will produce about 94,200 pages of a book. So basically it would take 530 billion trees to store one exabyte. So you might ask yourself, how many trees are there on the earth? Well, of course, somebody has counted them. <laughs> and in 2005, there was a study that said that there were about 400 billion trees of this size uh, that could be used for paper production on Earth. Obviously, I don't think this person studied numerical analysis or significant digits, but, <laughs> but that was their estimate. So basically, you can store a little less than one exabyte on you, by using all the trees on the earth to print these out. So it gives you a, a sense of how big an exabyte is and that we're producing hundreds of exabytes of new data uh, every year now. So it's, it's really amazing. So we think that one of the, the, the biggest challenges that we have of our century is how do we make use of all this data? How do we understand it? How do we store it? How do we archive it? How do we move it? All of these things become of interest. All right. So what I think is that we should use uh, parts of our brain that correspond to the visual understanding in order to help us understand uh, some of this data. And the reason I say that is because the visual senses that we have take up about half of our brain is used for image processing. This is a, a, a graph by Nortor, Nortranders, who's a physicist, and he was just making a simple view of, of showing you how much of your brain is, is devoted to what particular sense, and then this is to tell you about how fast each of those senses are. So the fastest part of our brain, and about half of it, is used for sight. The next one is touch, it's a little slower, then hearing and smell, and then taste. So taste is no, not very fast, <laughs> nor, nor is, it, it, is it very large. However, it's very important, uh, but you wouldn't want to use it necessarily to investigate your, your exabytes of data. All right, so this is an example uh, of physicists and how they think. This is uh, Richard Feynman, uh, Nobel laureate, who who uh, won his Nobel Prize, shared his Nobel Prize for his work in quantum electrodynamics. Um, and what he did was he created these things which are now called Feynman diagrams, which look like this. And they were ways in which he could visually, pictorially reason about very complicated phenomena. And in this case, they were these path intervals that were pages and pages of complex computations about interactions of particles and fields and he needed a way to, to better understand and reason about those, and he chose these visual representations to do this. Um, and he was able to then shorten in a way, instead of having to do all of those calculations by rote, he was able to reason with them pictorially. This is an, from an interview where uh, James Leake was asking him how he solved his problems. What I'm really trying to do is bring birth to clarity, which is really this half-acidly thought out semi -pictorial, or pictorial semi-vision thing. I would see the jiggle jiggle, uh, the wiggle of the path even now when I talk about the influence functional. I see the coupling and I take this turn. Well, I guess if there was a big bag of stuff and try to collect it in a way and to push it. It's all visual. It's hard to explain. And I think that that's a, a good view of when you ask people how they solve problems, that this is the kind of response that they get. But he was very much a visual thinker. Uh, and, and what we do at my institute is we spend a lot of time coming up with new visual abstractions, new ways that we can map large-scale, often complex data 
uh, to our visual senses in order to make uh, a, to better understand that large-scale complex phenomena. So some of it might be of anatomical nature where we know what uh, it looks like already. Others of it might be functional phenomena in fluid dynamics or the electrical activity of the heart or the stress of a foam being compressed. Um, and in some cases, it's not geometrical in the sense of our three dimensions plus time, but is really of much higher dimensional data spaces uh, in, in which we now have, uh, we're looking at visualizing numbers of network connections or other DNA sequences or something that uh, are high data dimension, but not of our standard three dimensional scientific space plus time. So how do we then create these useful abstractions for us to reason about our data? Uh, so people, scientists have from the beginning uh, used visualization to try and understand science. I think some of the most beautiful scientific visualizations come from da Vinci in which he, he drew these beautiful relationships of nature, of waves, of other natural phenomena in an effort to better understand the physical phenomena. Here is James Watson and Francis Crick um, looking at one of the early models of DNA, and they spent an enormous amount of time creating a three-dimensional model, uh, an abstraction, a visualization of DNA in order to understand and get the relationships right and ultimately figure out the final relationship. Um, there's what the, the model, the abstraction of that model looks like. Certainly today, uh, Biochemists and molecular biologists and geneticists use three-dimensional visualization all the time, every day, and these guys would too if they had had this kind of, uh, of three-dimensional visualization apparatus. Okay, so let me uh, talk about some collaborations that we've done and uh, how we're using visualization and then talk about some of the specific techniques. This is my colleague at Utah, Mario Capecchi, who won the 2007 Nobel Prize in Medicine or Physiology for his discovery on how to knock out a gene in a mouse when that, that ability has really changed our world and changed our lives. Um, this is the, uh, uh, one of the PR photos that the University of Utah sends out. I really like it because it was taken in my visualization lab. And, and this is a uh, visualization, a volume rendering of one of my former PhD students' heads, uh, Dave Weinstein. So we always kid Dave that he's the brain behind Mario, at least in this picture. <laughs> so one of the things that Mario is interested in doing is understanding the phenotype, um, how those genes instantiate our, themselves into our physiology. And one way he's getting at, at that is using high resolution imaging and visualization to help understand changes that those genes make. So this is an example of a project we worked with him this is a, in the middle here is an 18 day old mouse embryo. That's a high resolution X-ray CT scan. For size purposes, that, that size, that 18 day old mouse embryo is smaller than your little fingernail. Okay, so that's a normal. This is the same 18 day old mouse embryo, but it's had one gene changed, the Pax3 gene, which controls musculoskeletal development. Um, you can obviously see that there's a difference here. And now the question comes to us, how if we took populations of the wild type of the normal, and they have normal variations within them, and populations of the gene knockout, and their normal variations within them, how can we quantitatively compare and assess the changes and differences in what ways between those two populations of image scans? Um, well, this actually started a whole new area for us in the in shape analysis, and especially shape analysis of populations of images. And we created new visualization tools and abstractions and image analysis algorithms to be able to to solve some of those problems. Um, it then took a, an even greater turn in a positive way, in that my colleagues here, Sarang Josie and Ross Whitaker, Vito Garrett, Tom Fletcher, the image analysis faculty of, of the institute created this new computational statistics in nonlinear spaces where they could, um, they could uh, take the, these images, they could uh, take them to this, this nonlinear space, do the analysis, and then bring it back, and then say something quantitative about those changes. And what they're doing now is applying this kind of computational image analysis technique to find biomarkers in neurodegenerative diseases like Alzheimer's or autism 
at this time, there are no biomarkers. And by biomarker, I mean like a blood test or some test that we can give you that would say you have or you do not have this particular um, ailment. For most neurodegenerative diseases, there are no biomarkers. They have a collection of behavioral tests. Um, there might be genetic predispositions, but there isn't a biomarker. So we're now using images, non-invasive images, and this kind of analysis to be able to come up with biomarkers and links uh, to the genetics to say something more conclusive about these diseases. And it all started with a uh, collaboration and visualization and, and image analysis. Um, uh, Peter was talking about GPUs uh, in his talk, and uh, we are an NVIDIA center of excellence at Utah, so we have a 128 GPU double precision cluster in our institute that we use that's used all the time. What's interesting is that it's the image analysis people who use that cluster the most, uh, more so than the visualization and graphics and even the, and the scientific computing people. They are able to do these huge population image analysis uh, problems. They scale very well. They parallelize very well on these GPUs, and uh, they would use every GPU cycle that we had if we let them. All right, let me talk about some of the visualization techniques and some of the problems that, uh, that we solve with them. Uh, let me first talk about volume rendering. We've done some fundamental work in volume rendering algorithm and also software creation. This is a uh, volume rendering of a uh, Rickmeyer-Meshkoff uh, uh, mixing problem where you have two, uh, two fluids, a heavier fluid on the top and a lighter fluid underneath, and there's an interface between them, and then you move, remove that interface and it will start to mix. And after a while, it will, it will go into a turbulent mixing pattern. Uh, so you get these very complicated views of uh, very complicated dynamics within there. This is a very large scale simulation and we're using volume rendering, which is a technique by which we try to look at the entire volume of a scalar field rather than just a surface. So what we're doing is we're sending rays through the volume and then we're taking contributions of the scalar value as well as color and opacity or transparency and bringing those back to the view plane to try and visually uh, understand the volume of that data. Well, some of the work that we've done is to uh, create extensions of standard volume rendering into what are called multidimensional transfer functions. So transfer functions are those things that relate the data you see in the volume back to the view plane and that is the color and this uh, opacity here. And so you have to figure out a way that you can look through uh, very quickly and figure out where these interfaces of different subsurfaces or interesting features are and then have a way to then pull those out and bring them back to the view plane. Uh, most of the time, if you, if you take a, a volume renderer, it's a single transfer function. It just looks at data value and then an opacity and a color. And we extended this to be as high dimensional as you want, but for example, data value, gradient, or second derivative, and other features as well. And what you can do with that is that you can get a lot more specificity out of your data. So this is a tooth, and it's just an X-ray CT scan of a tooth. And here are different views of that same data by allowing, choosing different choices of color and different choices of opacity um, and you can see this internal structure is very well uh, that you wouldn't even be possible to look at from a, from a regular uh, one-dimensional transfer function. This is the uh, system that we created to do this. It's called ImageViz 3D. These are the two guys that did most of the work, Jens Kruger and Tom Fogel. Um, what is great about ImageViz 3D is that we've, we've worked on it to be for very large-scale data so that it has these hierarchical booking data structures in there that allow it to be scaled to very large data in terms of terabytes of data or more. Uh, this is uh, to show you a little difference about high dimensional transfer functions and how you might set up your own transfer function. On the top is a, a molecule data set and that was what you would look like as a standard single dimension transfer function where you could move around and change and see some of the internal structure that might be within the molecule here. What we'll do next is we'll put on a two-dimensional transfer function. As you can see, we get a lot more specificity of the data uh, to be able to look at. Down below, we're, we're 
we're creating a transfer function of something that you might do all the time. So a radiology technician might want to, well, they'll be looking at lots of these particular images and we're gonna set presets to look at skin, bone, uh, vasculature, and they can just pull down and uh, do this so they don't have to redo these uh, transfer functions for everything that they see there. All right, let me talk about some more large scale and issues within resolution and detail. If you were in medical imaging, you would know this guy. He's the most famous uh, medical imaging guy uh, around. He is the National Institutes of Health Visible Male. Um, several years ago, the National Institutes of Health had a program where they had the Visible Human Project, a male and a female that after death donated their bodies to the National Institutes of Health. They were imaged at high resolution from the, at the highest resolution they had. Um, and in the end, their bodies were frozen there was a camera on top, color camera, and they took pictures from the top and then they milled down them one millimeter at a time and made all of that data openly available online for the first time. So they really were the first gold standard human anatomy that we had. And everyone, all the people that were developing medical image analysis algorithms used these as a gold standard to test their algorithms. Well, it turned out that the data sets were very large, and especially the color data set, where there was multiple gigabytes of data, and at that time, there was no visualization system that could interactively visualize that much data. So what happened is that people did a lot of downsampling, um, and you got often pictures that looked like this. By the way, if you don't know, this is these cores here are registration cores, so those were glued onto the body because they moved them from different scanner to different scanner so they could register them. Um, this was one of the first data sets we put into ImageVis 3D, and because we could interact with that full data set uh, easily and we had these high dimensional transfer functions we could manipulate, we found out that this guy was covered with tattoos. Now, this is not a photograph. This is a volume rendering of the ink in the skin. So we chose to, to once we saw this, we chose, let's find a transfer function which pulls out the ink in the skin. If you think about the size of ink in the skin, and we're getting this just from two-dimensional slices of, of basically photographs, and we're finding the ink in the skin in that high-resolution photograph, and then being able to reconstruct a volume visualization of this. Um, if you, on a high-resolution monitor, you could actually see the red in the, uh, the flag over here. You can see mom uh, across here. People who had worked on this data for 10 and 15 years had never seen this before. And what's interesting about this is not that he was covered with tattoos, but that it was a small scale feature that was missed by the downsampling. And that there are small scale features in data, as Peter was saying, that are, that, that are very important that if you downsample or don't have enough resolution, you miss. So something to keep in, in mind. Here's a specific scientific example where it does matter. This is a combustion simulation from uh, Jacqueline Chen, who's at Sandia National Laboratories. Jackie does some of the largest combustion simulations in the world, uh, where she's using hundreds of thousands of CPUs for a long period of time, trying to understand fundamentals of combustion in terms of mixing and extinction and ignition. And what, she's, what this is, is she's looking at the chemistry effects of, that can influence mixing and reactive scalars and, and she's interested in basically in the visualization here of these little peaks and valleys. So you think of these as topographical maps. This is just one instance in time. She's interested in watching those peaks and valleys um, come up and go away. So they're ignition and extinction events. And the data set sizes that she has from her simulations are on the order of four and a half terabytes per time step. So you might imagine that's hard to visualize and there was no visualization system that could interactively look at that. Uh, so people downsampled. And what, what you're seeing here is a downsampled version of her data on the left and then the full resolution data of four and a half terabytes visualized on the right. And what we found was there were new peaks that came up that were visible in the high resolution data that you, could, that you missed completely in the low resolution data. Also, somewhat troubling, there were, there were indications of, event, of, of uh, features in the low resolution that actually disappeared once you went to full high resolution. 
So I want to get this across of the importance of thinking about your data and the resolution and the resolution of the features and how you deal with the large scaleness of the data in your analysis and visualization. In addition to just looking at that data and looking at the, the peaks and the valleys, the ignition and, and uh, extinction events, she wants to quantitatively know where those are and to be able to follow those through time. So this is a visualization of looking at a topological skeleton of the features of ignition and extinction in the context of the actual flame fronts from the combustion simulations. And we're now doing work that is able to analyze these features as a function of time. So in addition to the three-dimensional visualization that she gets where she can see visually and get a, a sense of where these things are happening in 3D space and time, she also can now get a time graph of the number of these in a quantitative way that she can look at. Now, what's really challenging is that it was already big enough data to look at visually. Now when you start doing the analysis on top of these, these really become both supercomputing computations and what she's also interested in doing is seeing this interactively. Uh, so we're now spending a lot of time working on how can we speed up the computations of both the visualization and the analysis so that they can be done in a more interactive or in situ way on these high performance computers. It's the case that, the, that these are such large computations of hundreds of thousands of cores that, and the data sets are so large that you really can't take and do your simulation and get your, your petabytes of data and then look at it. So we really need to use those supercomputers as they're doing the computations or nearly as and visualize them in the same, uh, in the same runs. So it's going to be a really amazing challenge for all of us as we get larger scale simulations, larger scale data in order to, to look at these. All right, at the other end of the spectrum with Images 3D, we uh, have a mobile version. And this is doing three-dimensional volume rendering on uh, an iPhone. And that's a 256 cubed X-ray CT scan of a hand. And that's actually being run on the GPU and CPU of the iPhone with full lighting and shading. It's really amazing because only a few years ago, that would be a $30,000 graphics workstation. And now it's in your pocket. Um, uh, what is also cool is that these new, the new iPads and tablets that we have are able to do this at high resolution. This is the iPad 3. And the uh, resolution on these retinal displays is just amazing, where we can see really high resolution versions of these uh, large scale and uh, data sets. We've now been working on this. We have a client server model so that if the data sets get larger and larger, we can have the, the computations done on a larger computer. Then it will send compressed images back over to the iPad wirelessly. These are big enough and high resolution enough where you can do real work on them. And especially physicians, but other collaborators, collaboration researchers as well, when you want to be able to look at something, you're walking around showing it to other people, patients, uh, other physicians, pulling up patient records. It will not be long in my prediction that you, before you go to your physician and they will have one of these and they will be pulling up records and showing you things and uh, done with this. So it's gonna be pretty interesting. Let me give you an example of one. We actually have an, a real application that's being used and it's a mobile app for deep brain stimulation um, tuning. Uh, people that have movement disorders, for example, Parkinson's disease, uh, there is now a treatment in which they place these electrodes into your brain. Those are electrodes. And they stimulate certain parts of the brain with electricity at a certain voltage. And what happens is that it basically stops the tremor. Uh, they don't fundamentally uh, physiologically understand it yet, they're working on that, but they do know that it works and it's become uh, a very important treatment for people who have very significant tremors. Uh, if you've ever seen, uh, they have some amazing videos which you can probably find online of people that have, they could not lead normal lives, they couldn't eat or pick up a cup of coffee or anything. Um, they turn on the batteries for this and basically they stop tremor, they can pick up, they can move, they can walk. 
they switch off again and they go back into the tremor state. The, the, uh, one of the challenges is after these are implanted is to be able to tune them specifically uh, to get the voltage right for you. So you don't want too much voltage, you don't want too little, and it's a, it's a process by which they go through, in a sense, many hours sometimes to get this right. And what we did was create an interface to the iPad that is able to do this much, much easier and it's patient specific. So the standard way to do it looks more like kind of like a handheld voltmeter, uh, has no three-dimensional visualization or any visualization at all except just number readouts and some knobs. And in this way, we have actually the, from the patient's images and brain where the, the stimulation electrode has been put on, uh, an estimation from a simulation of how much uh, the electricity is going for what, uh, for what amount of input voltage, and then uh, place specific features within the brain that they're interested in having that stimulation located at. And so they can see this and tune it um, interactively very easily, and it's, it's now taking them an order of magnitude or more or less time to get to this optimal tuning. So we're going to see lots of these apps all over the place soon. It's going to be amazing. All right, let me go through another uh, visualization technique which is called ray tracing. So ray tracing is the technique in which uh, we, we create these photorealistic types of, of images. So in all of the uh, animated movies you see and all of the special effects, ray tracing is the technique, graphical technique that is used. And basically we have an object that's in a field here and we have some light source that's there. And we're gonna bounce rays off the surface or through transparent objects, and then figure out a way how to bring them back to the view plane of your, of your computer. And through that, we can do shadows, we can do specular highlights, we can do transparency, um, we can do texture mapping, we can make some things look really realistic. Um, as scenes get larger and larger, uh, this becomes a more computationally uh, difficult problem. And for the way that we have addressed that in the, in the past has been primarily through hardware. So we created um, special hardware that was able to do uh, this, this kind of rasterization, this kind of uh, ray tracing. And, and this, this happened actually at the University of Utah. It was invented there back in 1974. And every computer graphics card and every computer is using that. So from your, the simplest ones that you have all the way up to the highest end NVIDIA card that you have is using this hardware ray tracing and rendering uh, that happens. Well, back in 1980, Turner Witted uh, created ray tracing and uh, what we found was that it was very slow compared to the hardware when the data sets were kind of of a small and medium size. However, if you parallelized ray tracing, then there was a, a, a point at which the rasterization was still scaling upward or at in terms of a more linear, but that rendering time started to drop as the data sets got larger and the complexity of the scenes got larger. So that software parallel ray tracing was now beating hardware ray tracing for a particular time. And so this became very interesting um, not too long ago, uh, especially for uh, manufacturers of graphics cards and other people that were doing multi-core. So on the NVIDIA side, they had the fastest graphics hardware in the world, and, but they saw that if you took enough parallel ray tracers, you could actually get the similar type of, of uh, rendering speed. And uh, so there was a, some interest in purchasing small rendering companies that were doing this in order to try to get the best of both worlds. So um, NVIDIA on the one side, Intel on the other side have gone out and and uh, hired and bought these companies, including one of ours, uh, a, in order to get this kind of technology either from the software side or from the hardware side. So we're gonna see this combination of parallel ray tracing and software from multi-core and also uh, using it on GPUs to get even faster speed up. Okay, so what, do you, what, what are the types of things that we would do with this? Did I just get louder at some, some point? Okay. Um, this is this great project from that uh, Mark Lavoy at Stanford uh, had on. Somehow he convinced the Uffizi Museum in Florence to give him full access to Michelangelo's David statue. And what he did was he spent uh, about a year 
using a laser range finding scanner, going in and scanning the statue at high resolution detail. He then made the, the data available um, in order to see who could visualize this amount of data. So what we're doing is zooming in here to the statue so you can see the intricate detail of the individual triangles that are there. So it's millions of triangles. And we could interactively visualize this using this parallel ray tracer. We could do, look at different times of the day. It used to be, the statue used to be outside so you could see it when different times of the sun. Um, so that was really cool. What is even cooler now is that he did it again at much higher resolution just recently. So this is the new uh, data set. We're gonna go back to that same place. Uh, this is now almost one billion triangles for that statue. Um, and each of the frames that you're looking at is two gigapixels. Not megapixels like your camera, but two gigapixels. Um, and we, at this resolution, it doesn't matter how much you zoom, you can't see individual triangles. They are so small. Um, it's just beautiful. And on the higher resolution screens, it looks like the statue is almost there. It's so high resolution. So this is a combination of research in the parallel ray tracing, but also in being able to interact with that much data, two gig gigapixel frames. So we're interacting with this with a regular computer. So we're moving this back and forth. So there's data streaming technology that we had to create to be able to interact with such large scale data sets. And that's the work of Valerio Pascucci, who created this, this system called Visus, which uses space filling curves and, and other cache oblivious techniques to be able to do high resolution data streaming. I'll show you that in the next slide. One of the things that I didn't know about uh, until I saw this was when this was out in the square, uh, some teenage kid carved his initials in the back of the left leg, M N. Uh, now you can't get close to the, the statue to be able to carve your initials in it, but uh, it was quite amazing. So a little bit of the technology in the back. So this is an overview of the architecture just to give you a flavor of the complexity of what's going on behind the scenes. So when I, I visualize that for you and I show you the, uh, the interaction and the beautiful images and I can tell you that they're two gigapixels and it all looks very nice, but this is what has to happen behind the scene in terms of the interactions between the I.O. and the scene graph and the, the streaming data, the graphics cards in OpenGL, the, the graphical user interfaces, the rendering windows, the compression, the network, the image conversion, the database, all of that has to be underneath there. And then beyond that are the individual algorithms that make up the streaming that makes it so fast. So these space filling curves and the interactions of the hierarchy with the data. Uh, so this is a, a, a page out of a paper that will be in supercomputing uh, 2012 in November of a new algorithm that's, that, that speeds up that interface, that streaming even more. So just to give you a flavor of some of the real, the computer science algorithm de development that can be behind the scenes in a lot of these beautiful images that you're seeing. Uh, since Peter was talking a lot about astronomy, I thought I would put up my astronomy video. Uh, this is work with Elena Diagna, who's at uh, Harvard. Uh, she's an astrophysicist. She visited Utah a while ago. She does some of the larger astrophysics simulations in the world on ga galaxy formation. And she had heard that we did large-scale visualization, so met with me when, during her visit and asked, said, she now had a sim her largest simulation ever and she couldn't visualize it. She didn't have the tools to be able to visualize that much data. Uh, and so could we help? I said, I, th I think we can. Uh, I won't know until I see the data. And about a week later, I got a FedEx and the FedEx contained a four terabyte disk <laughs> and it had all of her data on it. Uh, so we read in that data and we used that, that ray tracing system, the real time ray tracing system, the software render uh, to be able to visualize her uh, galaxy formation data. And she was thrilled. She flew out uh, and sat with us, and we talked about the interaction and collaborations of how we're going to look at this data and what she wanted to see from it. And she was getting real physics out of being able to visualize this, uh, this data set. It's also very pretty, too. Uh, all right. I also want to follow on some of Peter's work when he's talking about images and the large scale nature of an analyzing images. Instead of looking at stars and supernova, I'm going to look at neurons. Um, 
This is work as part of the uh, International Connectome Project, which is a set of, of scientists, neuroscientists internationally that are trying to understand the fundamental wiring diagrams of our brain. And they're using electron microscopy image, images to be able to do that. Um, this is the highest resolution set of images of the retina of the brain. And to give you a sense of how big it is and the resolution, if you look at one of these little squares here, that's the max resolution of an electron microscope. That's 4,000 by 4,000 pixels, okay? So what they do is they have a system to take the smallest um, piece of the brain tissue and then scan it at the highest resolution. Then they dump out the data and then they go to the next piece. Dump out the data, go to the next piece. Runs 24 hours a day, seven days a week. And then when it comes out, it doesn't quite look like this because they don't all magically fit together. There's a registration process. And when after that registration process is done, this we get a single image that's about 150,000 pixels by 150,000 pixels. So just to give you a sense of what that is, your HDTV is about 2,000 by 1,000 pixels. So your 50-inch you know, plasma to screen at home would fit right in there uh, for your HDTV. So now that they have this, they want to visualize it and analyze it. But that's not the whole story because they're really looking at the connectivity. So once they do one slice, they do the next slice and the next slice and the next slice. And as you can see, there are missing pieces of data. There are, uh, they can never slice as much as, as resolution as they can do for the imaging. And so you get a much higher resolution in the plane than when you go down into the depth. So the tracking of those neural processes becomes uh, a fundamental problem in image analysis in itself. When they get done, it's about 16 and a half terabytes of data. So it was just very similar size to one of the, the big data sets uh, that Peter was talking about from a night sky for about 15 terabytes of data. Um, and uh, our resolution is two nanometers per pixel, two times 10 to the minus ninth per pixel. That's really small. <laughs> All right, so they say, look at this and visualize this. I put this picture of Anthony Leeuwenhoek here to remind me that he was one of the innovators of the light microscope, and because he could see things at higher resolutions than others, he made fundamental science discoveries. He discovered a lot of new things of science because he could see these things at very high resolution. Well, I think of ourselves along with Robert Mar Mark, the, the neuroscientist, and being able to create these large-scale visual analysis tools and coupled with the, the microscopy innovations that he's done, we can now take that entire 16 and a half terabyte data set and interactively visualize it. Um, and the scientists, this is a, a 24, uh, 30 inch monitor wall that we put together to be able to take that data set and just zoom in and look through it. The scientists are seeing new structures that they've never seen before. They're making discoveries by looking. Uh, now, the by looking is hard. It, it took all of those algorithms and new microscopy technology, but I think it's really cool. Now, what they want to do is they want to be able to do analysis by saying, let's touch this particular component and say, how many of those types of, of, of cell bodies are in this volume or track this particular process through? Uh, we can't do that right now, at least not in interactive time. Uh, so there's a lot of really interesting research for the future. All right, let me switch to now from scientific visualization to uh, 3D space and time to more high dimensional visualization. This is uh, our newest faculty member at the, at the Ski Institute. It's Mariah Meyer. She uh, came to us from Harvard. She was one of the TR35 innovators this year, which is really great. One of the things that Mariah does is she works on high dimensional biological problems, specifically genetics and molecular biology where you don't have a three-dimensional structural nature. You basically have these sets of, of letters that correspond to, to the components of, of DNA and molecules. And she's interested in finding ways to find patterns in those large-scale uh, data sets. The thing that's different about her often than other visualization researchers is many visualization researchers come up with a new technique and then they go and find applications that it might work on. She does it exactly the opposite, where she works with an individual scientist, uh, reads their papers, 
uh, interviews them about their scientific goals and challenges, and then she goes off and creates and designs a visual interface for that particular problem. And then we'll come back and say, this is my first iteration and prototype. Um, and then they iterate back and forth and back and forth until there is a new, never been used before interface to solve that particular problem. These are some examples of four different visualization systems that she created to solve four different problems. Let me give you an example of one of them. This is with a uh, comparative geneticist who's at the Broad Institute at MIT. And what he's interested in doing was finding models of comparison between human genetics and then other um, animal mammalian genetics. And he had a theory about how this would work and in and what ways and modeling it. This was the first visualization that he saw of his new model and he immediately knew it was wrong because not this stuff in here was not supposed to be there. It was, uh, it was noise in the system basically. So he went back and he tuned his model and this was his second view of what it looked like. And from this, this interaction and visualization he figured out his model was fundamentally wrong and that he had to redesign his model. Once he did that, he came back and this was the final visualization that was proven experimentally to be correct uh, with his model and a nice publication that came out of it. Mariah asked him how long he thought it would have taken him to get to this place without her visualization tool. And he said, quite frankly, I don't think I ever would have gotten there. So this is this view of, of visual reasoning and, uh, that we have of using proper tools, the right abstractions, the right visualization tool to be able to work with uh, the data and your science. All right, I'm gonna finish up here with, an, with something I'm very interested in and, and trying to get people more interested in, which is uncertainty. And I ask you, when is the last time you've seen an error bar in a three-dimensional visualization? Including any of mine that I've just shown you. And the answer is probably never. If you look at, at experimental sections in Nature and Science and other, and Tizrev and other, other journals, you'll see a very detailed explanation of errors and graphs with, with error bars on them to show the validity and explanation of where those errors are. But in computational science, because I think that it was so difficult just to even visualize and look at the data and simulate it in the first place, we have not taken that next step to do the quantitative uncertainty analysis and, and the, the visualization of those uncertainties and errors. This is an example I use to motivate this. Uh, this is a brain data set. Unfortunately, this person has a large tumor here. Um, we represent these usually by isosurfaces after segmenting the images. Well, let's do some segmentation here. I think you or a radio, an algorithm would, be, would do a good job of finding the edge of that particular tumor. Tell me where the edge is on this side. Well, if you throw segmentation algorithms at this, here's the extent of the algorithms. On the left-hand side, they're very close. And I would be comfortable telling the surgeon if this was my brain to cut on the red dotted line. On the other side, because there's more uncertainty, the algorithm difference is much larger. Where do you tell the surgeon to cut if this is your brain? Be aggressive, do the inner one. No, they look even more brain there. Oh, just do the median. Well, they have to make these decisions under uncertainty. And what we're doing is two things that are not good here. One, we're not showing any levels of certainty or uncertainty. Secondly, we're representing the final with just one single image as an isosurface. Surfaces play an important role in our perception because they are how we get around in the world. When we see a surface, our brain has a, a little thing that says true. It's because that's, we need to know that surfaces are true. So by putting a surface there, our brain immediately says true. And if we don't do anything to dissuade that by showing some uncertainty, we kind of doubly damage the visualization. So we have been spending a lot of time thinking about new abstractions and visual ways to, to characterize that uncertainty. This is another great example of uh, things that you have seen uh, in visualization and in fluid dynamics. This is a, a topological skeleton with some line interval convolution that shows the uh, critical points in a particular flow. All of those are assuming there's no error or uncertainty. Um, what happens if you start to now visualize some of that error and uncertainty? Well, here's what it looks like with a little bit of, of error. 
here's a little bit more, here's a little bit more. These three, which are probably much more realistic in the world, have a very different look and you would make different analysis from it than the zero error, zero uncertainty view. This one looks prettier, but these are probably more realistic. Um, this is a, a, some work we did on using that multidimensional transfer function um, in order to visualize some of the uncertainty. So instead of looking at data value or data gradient, we now looked at things like confidence intervals or sensitivity to a particular variable. So this one shows the 90th, the 95th, and the 98th confidence intervals of the data so we could immediately see which of parts of the data are the most certain, uh, the most confident, and which ones are the least confident. Um, I think this, we, this is just the tip of the iceberg of where we need to go. This is a, a new system we're working on right now which is called QuizLens and the idea, this came about because one of the things we were running up against is that when you visualize uncertainty for many applications, you don't want to overemphasize where it's uncertainty because you're trying to make decisions about, you want to use the best data that, that you know is certain, but you want to know where the uncertainty is, but don't overwhelm where you're just concentrating on the uncertainty. So this was a lens system by which you could just go in and kind of turn on a lens and hold that over to be able to say, oh, here's some certain and uncertainty regions, but then see the real data uh, and investigate that. So we're still working on this. Okay, let me uh, do this and I will end. <laughs>from an interview a couple of years ago um, that was made into a little documentary on high performance computing and it, I was interviewed for more than two hours and they kept two minutes. One of the things that's happened I think recently on, on the visualization side is the ability to see things at these, these high, high resolutions for the first time um, and, the, and the ability to see them in more of an, a time dependent interactive way rather than a played back movie from one viewpoint has allowed scientists to gain insight that they couldn't get in any other ways. And this is how we progress in science. These are the tools that we've created that open new windows for the scientists to see in new ways. If you look at many, maybe even most of the great discoveries throughout mankind, you'll find that, that before the great discovery was the creation of a new tool or a tool that's been used in a new way. And that's really where high performance computing and visualization, these high uh, resolution display walls that people are creating, um, the, the graphics cards that, that people are creating, the, the hardware side, the new algorithms, the software, these are the new tools for these scientists to look at their data and their science in new ways and will make new discoveries because of it. And we're really starting to be able to work not only in, in this particular application, but in many applications where you're taking the best people in computer and computational science and the best people in neurosurgery or physics or whatever it is, and you're working together to solve problems that neither of you could solve previously. And I think that's where we're at with a lot of different applications is that we're at this tip of the iceberg where we are going to see a golden age of scientific computing and specifically for some of the applications we're working in is the applications of computing in medicine where we're going to be able to transform some of the ways that they do medical imaging and diagnosis and treatment um, with computing and it's going to be I like the, the golden a lot of age. us really feel like we're in this golden age where we've been working up you know taking these things that the, the fastest computers and the best software that we've had, but it really could only do a small portion of what we wanted it to do in terms of addressing the complexity and the needs that we had and, and answering the questions that we had. And I think we're just getting to this point where we're seeing that we're able to, with the advanced hardware and software and algorithms that we're starting to be able to answer some of these questions that we've always wanted to answer for the very first time starting to open windows into discovery that we've never been able to open before and that's leading us into very new and very interesting places and I think it's leading to this, this golden age of where scientific computing is going to change the way we do science and medicine. 
Once I said golden age, they wanted me to use it in sentences multiple times, so that was, that was hard. Okay, so these are uh, the smiling faces of the people that did a lot of the work that I talked about, all those graduate students who were there. We have uh, 80 PhD students from eight different departments uh, working together. Uh, and we, we, you need good productivity machines. We have, I think, five espresso machines. And uh, there's our, uh, our ping pong table which is always open, and I hope you will all join uh, me at Supercomputing 2012 in beautiful Salt Lake City. Um, thanks for all the, the people who paid the bills, and thank you for listening. Thanks.